Today, I ask Paula Fredrickson if the God of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, First Testament, evolves over time. This is outside of her expertise, but I had an anonymous helper who helped us make this trip possible to Paula Fredrickson. Thank you. You know who you are. I wanted to ask this question either way. And it was really interesting how she took it from the Hebrew Bible into the Christian God. Paula Fredrickson, Dr. Fredrickson, I have a very good friend who wants to remain anonymous. Uh, they help us out here at Myth Vision. And um, he had a question I asked of Dr. Bart Ehrman. Of course, it's not his specialty, even though I think he has a master's in something, the Hebrew Bible or something. But uh, Bart Ehrman took a jab at it. And of course, I know this isn't your expertise. Just, uh, you know, how you have those warnings, uh, batteries not included. <laughs> This is what we're dealing with. It's a question that's outside of what you write on, what you publish on, what your expertise is on, but you might have uh, something you might want to say. Okay, let's try it. I would be interested in her views on whether Yahweh began as a tribal mountain or volcano god around the 13th century BC that over time acquired the attributes of competing Canaanite gods such as El and Baal. Also, do you believe, oh, let's just start with that. Um, it's not my field, but I have read in the field. Uh, Thomas Hormer, um, for example, talks about um, um, the, the way that um, earlier Canaanite and um, different Semitic gods merged with the figure of uh, the God of Israel and certain attributes um, are attributed to him that are like the attributes of Baal or the other deities. I don't know if it happened on a Wednesday in the 13th century BCE, but um, that it makes sense that God talk is cumulative and gets used. And I think that um, ideas of God are very plastic. And I know from the period I do know something about, which is Roman antiquity, that there's um, an interesting transition where the God of Israel is an ethnic God. It's just that he's gonna do this amazing act of cross-ethnic outreach when he declares his universal sovereignty. But he's also the God of Jewish history. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of Israel. And, um, and then what happens in the second century when you're reading somebody like Justin Martyr is that suddenly this God, the highest God, becomes the ethnically featureless God of Middle Platonic philosophy. He's leached of all ethnic characteristics. He's e even leached of historical characteristics. And what he has is a lieutenant God who Justin identifies as the pre-incarnate Christ, whom he calls a heteros theos, another God. This is mm. Justin Martyr. Um, and that's the God who shows up in the Septuagint that's the God who's manipulating matter, which is what a demiurge does in Middle Platonism. So you have this, um, uh, this change in the conceptualization of God once you have people with different mental furniture declaring something that has started out as a very Jewish, a very Jewish message, and it becomes Platonized. So, and then of course, when you get Trinitarian stuff a couple more centuries down the pike, that's another... Um, reformatting of the idea of, of God, of the idea of, of the Jewish God who's, who continues to change as, as Gentile Christianity develops. So to go back to the original question about Yahweh, nothing would be more antecedently probable, I think, than that if when um, the people who are Yahwist are trying to articulate their beliefs about their God, that they grab what they can from from their surrounding culture, which are these other Semitic cultures. I love it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Justin Martyr, uh, when you said that, made me think like, hold on, another God? Um, here we are again. And Christ is this other God, which would mean, how did the Trinitarians feel later if they had read this? Uh... Well, um, Justin is uh, pre-Nicaea. Mm -hmm. So he's, um, he's comfortable with the idea of another God. Remember, Philo called the Logos right. a, a second god. I mean, you if you have this high god, and then how do you get matter organized? And the high god is perfect and therefore changeless. Well, you have you have a contractor, right. a contractor god. 
which is what the demiurge is. Um, so Jesus is demiurgic for um, Justin, and uh, he has no problem having it be a subordinate, a subordinate God. As long as you have one God on top, you're an ancient monotheist, right? So right. Um, there, there can be multiple divinities, and um, Jesus, is, Jesus is that. Where you end up with the Trinity, Is it, it's basically a problem in late Middle Platonism and um, Neoplatonism, where you have the functions of the high God specified. You have a, a high God whose aspect in himself is radically transcendent and unknowable. You have uh, the aspect of the high God that faces out to uh, cosmic spiritual creation and you have the God that's involved with, um, with matter. And what we have in Origin of Alexandria, for example, is this argument, it's brilliant. Unfortunately, Origin was condemned as a heretic in the sixth century, but he says that, the, uh, that God timelessly generates rational souls that are embodied, because to have a principle of individuation, they have spiritual bodies, but they have body. And God is the only thing that is radically unembodied and self-generated. But within the Godhead, you have graduated degrees of Godness. You have God the Father, who's above everything. You have God the Son, who's responsible for material creation in particular. And then you have God the Holy Spirit, who all of these are non-embodied gods, but, and the Holy Spirit's particular ballywick is the church. So you have a graduated trinity within a unified deity in origin. And so he's already, again, you can see the struggle that theology depends on philosophy the way physics depends on math. You need to have the developments in philosophy come along before you can have these theological problems. So that's how you end up with the Trinity. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it definitely makes sense. And I was thinking about Paul, going back to your whole idea of who the Demiurge would be to Paul. And it makes me think, is it Christ? Because Christ, I mean, Paul's entire martyrdom complex is built off of this Jesus death. And is he envisioning Jesus as this this Demiurge? Well, which... he does say that uh, he through, through whom all things are, right? Right. Through whom. So he definitely He's, sees it. That's a demiurgic. Right. Hmm. The other part of the question is, is also, do you believe such episodes as the Exodus and conquest actually occurred, despite there being little or no archaeological evidence to support them? More generally, are the episodes and personages as presented in the Pentateuch historical or just myth and legend, as Ehrman concludes? How mythological is the Bible? Can we get archaeological data that supports the historicity of the legends that we have in the Bible? I don't think so. Um, does that... The stories are significant for, as a myth of origin, for the, and in that sense, they're significant. But I don't think their being historically true is even an interesting question. Yeah, I think that it's more like, uh, who was it? There's a, f I can't remember the name of the person who said that if something is historically true, right? Okay, so what? It happened. But like a myth stays alive forever. Okay. That's right. Myths, myths have a, well, myths have a life cycle. They're born, they flourish, and they, and they die unless it's a myth of the imminent return of Christ, which is <laughs> that's ever you know, it stays evergreen. It made me think if, and this is like, I have probably no way to even see this right now, but like with Greek mythology, like we see it as Greek mythology. We go, eh, mm -hmm. we don't think Zeus or any of this stuff about mm -hmm. him actually occurred or happened. Yeah. Um, but people don't really believe in them. I'm not going to say there aren't people in like Scandinavia or somewhere, you know. That... Who knows? People believe all sorts of stuff. People still refer to star charts and astrology. Once right. the earth was no longer in the center of the universe, astrology shouldn't have made any difference. Right. But it didn't miss a beat because your soul used to drop through and bump into different stars and then go into your fleshly body. Right. And that's why you had to know when you were born so that you would know which stars and planets had influence over your soul. 
geo switch from a geocentric universe to a solar universe. Everybody still going to be astrology charts in the newspaper, right? It didn't exactly. stop anything. Yeah, I was thinking. Yeah. I wonder if I wonder if Christianity and stuff like that will start to get kind of viewed that way over time. I suspect um, it's pretty vigorous, and there are all sorts of Christianities. Right. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Hmm. Thank you to those who contributed in the GoFundMe on making this trip possible for these twelve recordings with Paula Fredrickson. I want to give a special shout out to you. Your names are chiseled in history. I also want to thank everybody who has become a patron of Myth Vision, making stuff like this possible, taking academic work that is hiding behind all of these scholarship, all of these colleges, and making it public, public knowledge for everybody to learn. Thank you.